one, a two, a one. It's time for the Better Horses Radio Show. So let's saddle up and ride as we explore the Western way of life, horses and cows, family and friends, a relationship with the land, and a relationship with God. It's all here on Better Horses Radio. Now let's hit the trails with the Better Horses team. And welcome to Better Horses Radio. I'm Ed Adams. And I'm Merle Arbo. And you know, I am excited about this show because this is going to be one of those shows where we have across the country from Mississippi all the way to Texas and then to California. Merle, these trainers have different genres, but they all have great things to add to our show. Oh, a very diverse background. I mean, a Western pleasure gal years ago, if you all remember, invested dimension. And, and Justin, of course, does a lot of all around horses and trail, especially. And then Michael, um, which is interesting to me, he, he is very big in the possos and the gated horses. You know, we're talking about Michael Gascon, the horse guru from Poplarville, Mississippi. And then we're going to have Justin Brown from near Fort Worth, Texas. And he's been in the show ring. Justin's a good friend of mine. He's been on our, our television show also. And you've seen her in our show and also in our newspapers. She's been on a radio show before. A well-known quarter horse trainer, probably considered one of the best female trainers of the quarter horse industry, Dana Hokana, will be coming on our show as they wrap it up. And I think it was more important about this industry, Merle, it's growing. People are looking for feedback. Who do I go to? So we're trying to spread it across the entire country. Oh, yeah. We want, I mean, we want somebody that you in your backyard, maybe. And the only way to get in your backyard is to go all over the country. <laughs> so let's get into it. And Merle, our first segment is brought to you by Klein Smith's Western Wear, located in Higginsville, Missouri. I'm telling you, 30,000 square feet of just of the best Western gear anybody could ever get a hold of. It is unofficially America's largest Western store. <laughs> check it out. Klein Smith's Western Wear. You can check out their website at kleinboot.com. That's K-L-E-I-N boot.com. You know, as we said, this is going to be one of our best programs as we bring you one of the top trainers and clinicians around the country. We're going to head down to Mississippi, more specifically, Poplarville, Mississippi. And we're going to introduce a young man who's in probably one of the most award-winning horse estates in the world. And this is Horse Haven Ranch. And this is where you can find the Gascon Horsemanship family. Now, before I, I introduce this guy, the Gascon Horsemanship journey goes back five generations and includes many world championships and a variety of disciplines. He loves Pasifino, so I can't wait to get him on board. Everybody, welcome, Michael Gascon. Michael, thank you for joining Better Horses. Hey, bud. Thank you so much for having us on. We're so happy to be here. Now, I know you're in the middle of a clinic, and I know you're going through lots of training, but one of the tips that I really thought was impressive is that you, when we're talking about lessons, is that you said one of the biggest horse lessons you've ever learned was you don't have to wear out the horse to get him to do what you want. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely, bud. So I was lucky enough to be raised by a Hall of Fame Pasofino trainer and my father, and I was raised on the show circuit with Pasofino. Well, when it was my turn to take over the family ranch, I decided that I wanted to be a clinician and go around helping people become safer and create a better bond with their horse. I started studying all the greats of natural horsemanship and when I would read those books and watch those videos and try that with my horses, quite frankly, I felt like a blubbering idiot. I was doing everything that I saw and it just wasn't working for me. And I felt like, man, all my life, I, I, what have I actually learned? And it was because, because so much of what I was learning, the punchline of horsemanship was if they don't like what you're doing, wear them out and they will. If they don't want to do something, wear them out and they'll want to do it. Well, when you try that with a hot horse, that's the equivalent of trying to get a marathon runner to run a lap. They just laugh at you as they run circles around you. So I had to start hmm. creating a different path and start working these horses from cold and not use their shape or laziness as a weapon because they're not lazy and they're happy to work. And that's where we really started learning how to control the head, control the horse and work from cold. And when I got on the clinic tour and started working all the different breeds, I realized, wait a second, it not only works on really hot horses, but it does amazing on cold, dull horses. 
imagine if you have a lazy horse that doesn't want to work instead of wearing them out and then trying to get them to work imagine if you worked them while they were as fresh as they can be and that's just what we do here you know i absolutely love this point so let's kind of get into specifics here i have a hot, hot horse it's a thoroughbred and trying to get it to its thinking side of the brain, which we always talk about, what are some of the techniques you use? Well, we do what we call the respect series. We start in kindergarten. As a matter of fact, we're doing a retreat right now and we have a few thoroughbreds here being worked. The very first thing we do in kindergarten is simply ask the horse to back up. And you would be amazed how many horses have a college education, but they've never been through elementary school, meaning they are an off the track horse or they are a dressage horse or they're a rainer or they're a roper. They have this really high level education, but we use the word quirky or like you said, they don't want to get to the thinking side of their brain. And the reason being is when we start, no matter what you bring to us, we start in kindergarten, they will fail. I mean, just absolutely. Like you ask a little kid to answer to a question, they have no idea what the answer is. They will completely and utterly fail. So what we do is we start in the very beginning, which is, backing them up out of our space to gain their respect and then the, one of the bigger changes is our lunging system we're lunging a two-foot circle around these horses and you say a two-foot circle that doesn't make any sense your thoroughbred cannot run will not run in a two-foot circle and if they don't respect you enough to get in that small circle without running into you well you probably shouldn't ride them and if a two foot circle makes them drag you. I mean, we probably shouldn't be on their back. So it becomes very revealing to you very quickly how much they respect you, how much they're paying attention to you. And a lot less of it has to do about how trained they are and more about most people get hurt on a trained horse that knows how to ride. But they're getting hurt on trained horses is because the horse isn't respecting them or paying attention. And we do a very good job, if I must say, of figuring that out and then working on it if it needs help. You know, Michael, a little known fact about me is the very first judge's card I ever got was a Missouri Fox trotting judge's card. That's a true story. <laughs> and very cool. I think what's interesting for me is, is you don't give gated horses a pass. I, I, I think, and I've, I got, I don't know if you know, but I'm, I'm a quarter horse judge now also, but I think in the, in the gated circles, there's a lot of people that give the gated horses to pass and say, well, my, my horse won't do this because he's a Pasofino or my horse won't do this because it's a walking horse, you know, like backing, you know, for example. And I think that's interesting. And, and also uh, one of my favorite things is where you're all are sitting around and you're throwing this big ball uh, around on these Pasofinos that should just leave the arena, but you, you do that at home. Can you tell us more about how you do that and why you do that? Absolutely. First and foremost, uh, I'm a professional cult starter and meaning I'm a professional elementary school teacher. And in the beginning, I wanted to practice my cult starting as much as I could. So when I started going to clinics, I started just using my participants and say, hey, can I borrow your horse and go? And what I didn't tell them, I was going through my cult starting program step by step. And I had this crazy epiphany. If I get a very advanced horse that's problematic, instead of trying to fix the lead or work on the advanced thing or the headset or the bridling, if I go back to the fundamentals and fill in the potholes, whatever it's missing, I can get the horse to do anything that I want. So regardless, I use the word colt starting because that's any colt, that's any young horses, and I treat them all like they know nothing. Once I get the basis of my colt starting program done, whether it's a Paso or a Pergeron or a Pony or a Saddlebred, or a, it doesn't matter. If you can control the head, you can control the horse. If I have control of their face and their butt, I can rope off of anything. I can shoot off of anything. I can take anything up the mountainside. And the type of horse that's there, for a lot of folks, if they came to my retreat that's going on right now, and they saw 20 different breeds of horses right now being worked, in this one week, they will all play a soccer game. They will all go to the obstacle course. They will all go on trails. They will all go and chase cows, and we'll do cattle sorting and ranch sorting, and we'll rope, swing ropes off of them. We don't give them any passes for their excuse. We say, hey, you're a horse. We believe you can do this, and it's amazing. If you treat the horse like the horse they can become, they'll become that horse. If you treat that horse like the victim or the horse that it is, that, oh, it's too spooky, it's too hot, it's too gated, we will forever live in that shadow. You know, I love your point where you said 
any breed can do anything. When we talk about roping, you, you I naturally look at the gold standard, which is quarter horses, but you'll take a thoroughbred and you'll rope off them with cattle. So you don't fall into that trap where these horses are bred for specific jobs. Absolutely. Now, don't get me wrong. If you want your child to be in the NBA, it would help if you're six and a half, seven foot tall and your wife is six and a half, seven foot tall, the <laughs> chances of them being a high level NBA player, but you can teach anybody basketball. So it's the same way. As a matter of fact, my personal horse is a uh, Pasofino. And my goal when I started roping was to win a roping with a Pasofino. Uh, and I won my first buckle about a year and a half ago after picking up roping very late in life. And it was all funny in the warm up pen with him gating around until we came out of that heel box like we were on fire. Uh, and you get a couple clean catches and, and stop the clock. And it's not so funny anymore. <laughs> but some somebody had to believe it possible first for that to happen. You know, that's exactly right. I love the fact that you have multiple generations behind you. So you got to see a lot of styles. And more importantly, you got to see our we progress our training from the 80s. I think your mom was the second youngest woman to win the Congress in the 80s. And your dad, as you mentioned, was a world renowned Pasifino trainer with multiple world championships. But that training has changed a lot in the last 30 to 50 years. What have you thought? What do you think? I think the evolution of horsemanship has gone from a straight line. I did the, the Mongol Derby, which is the longest, toughest horse race in the world across Mongolia. There you go. And represented the United States there. And I fixed safari horses in Africa. And depending on who you ask, Asians or Africans, who were the first on horses, it was Asians or Africans. Their style of riding is fast and straight. And then when you go to Europe and work horses, they're very stuck on dressage. Four or 500 years ago, dressage happens, and the form of the big circle shows up. Two people working the horse shows up, and that circle starts taking away some of the athleticism of the horse to allow for more riders on their back. 60 or 70 years ago here in America, natural horsemanship, the Ray Hunts, the Tom Dorrances, those guys, and round pinning. Fun fact, if you leave Western civilization, you don't find round pins anywhere else. So the round pin is an even smaller circle. And now today in 2024, we feel like we're the tip of the spear, the, the most evolved uh, riding out there. We are making circles so small that the horse's nose is pointed to their butt and we're in the middle of that lunge circle, that close to the horse. And what we find is we're making more forgiving horses uh, more efficiently than ever before. I did not know that about round pens. In the domestic United States, that's where it's found. There's nowhere else to be found anywhere yes. else. So I, I've worked horses in every continent that has horses and in Canada, <laughs> America, or South America, in Australia, those places you find round pins. In Asia, I didn't see one round pin. I did a whole European tour and did all kind of cult starting over there. I didn't see one round pin. We were starting things in dressage arenas. For those of you listening, a dressage arena, you're starting a 17 hand warm blood and the dressage fence is a foot tall. And I'm a country boy, but that math don't math. But we figured it out because we can control the head. We control the horse. The round pin is not necessary. If you're just joining us, we're talking to Michael Gascon from Gascon Horsemanship from Mississippi. Michael, if people wanted to go to your clinics, because you're traveling all over the place. And as you just mentioned, you're traveling internationally. What's the best way to get a hold of you? And what's the best way to uh, contact you? The best way to, to get in touch with us is at horsehelp.com. But we have this most amazing thing. So we are trying to reach the masses. So we are giving away all this information. Right now going on, we have something called the Horse Help Challenge, where we are doing 30 days live of horse training. And we are starting at preschool of our program and every day going through a new grade. And it is free to the public because the stamp that we want to leave on the horse industry, our mission is that there is a common safety knowledge. So through this horse help challenge, we every day at seven o'clock in the evening, we are going through this challenge and we have a couple thousand people on there. Uh, we were talking and answering questions last night till like 10 at night. And we are going through a new step. People are challenging, you can win prizes. It's try to get everybody involved in understanding, hey, if that horse runs you over, you shouldn't ride it. If that horse drags you, you shouldn't ride it. But also, this is what you can do to make it safe. And that's at horsehelpchallenge 
www.ethicalcoachingcenter.com. You can sign up for free right there. And you can win retreats. You can win saddles, halters, and more importantly, you can create a better, safer bond with your horse. Man, I absolutely love that. Uh, get horsehelp.com. You also mentioned get challenge. I'll let you repeat that URL one more time. Okay, it's horsehelpchallenge.com. Horsehelpchallenge.com. Michael, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on board. We're looking forward to more videos on the Better Horses TV show. I think it's great what you're doing. You're really grabbing a lot of masses right now, and, uh, and I appreciate all the traveling you're doing, teaching us exactly what we need to know about horses. Thank you uh, so much for letting me on your platform and having me here. Uh, I really respect you guys, and it was awesome to talk to you today. You're talking to Michael Gascon. I'm Ed Adams. And I'm Merle Arbo. We're going to be right back right after these messages. 2024 is the year to compete in the world's largest horse show, the Pinto World Championship. This 13-day event begins June 8th, starting with our youth weekend through June 22nd, and caters to all riding levels and ages. With over $1 million in cash and prizes, there are no qualifications required to enter. Held in Tulsa, Oklahoma, located at the Ford Complex, the Pinto World Championship caters to all types of equines. With over 700 classes, the Pinto Show welcomes a variety of breeds to compete. It's a family environment with healthy competition. For more information, check out the website PintoWorld.com. We're here for the hardworking, the resilient. We're for the people who measure their days by what needs to get done, not by hours. Where kids learn responsibility at a young age and generations work side by side. Where work doesn't pause for holidays or bad weather, it just gets harder. Where value and hard work means more than the clothes you wear. We're Kleinschmidt's Western Store. Higginsville, Missouri. Internal parasite control is critical to your horse's health, but isn't always easy. Some worms are as stubborn as they are dangerous. Luckily, there's Panicure Finbendazole from Merck Animal Health. It works in a powerful and extremely safe way, so it's tough on parasites, but gentle on horses, making it a safe choice for foals, weanlings, and even thin or debilitated horses. Consult your veterinarian for assistance in the diagnosis, treatment, and control of parasitism, and ask how Panicure can become part of your deworming strategy. Learn more at MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com. Routine dental examination and treatments are essential for high quality horse care. To prevent potential problems, a horse's mouth should be examined at least once a year. I'm Dr. Chris Blevins, equine field service veterinarian at Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center. We can examine the mouth and provide a treatment plan to meet the needs of each client and their horse. Visit us at KSVHC.org, the Veterinary Health Center, to discover to teach, to heal. And we are back with another segment of Better Horses. And you know what, Merle? I got to tell you, this is a really good show because we're going all over the country here. We're going to be in Mississippi. We're going to Texas and we're going to have somebody from California. This is going to be really exciting. And this segment is brought to you by the Pinto Horse Association of America. And if you're not familiar with the Pinto World Championship show held in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's going to be at the fairgrounds beginning Saturday on June 8th. And it's going to go all the way to the 22nd. Merle, I know you're going to be there. You've judged this place. And this is over 700 classes, one of the world's largest shows in the United States. It is the world's largest single breed horse show. So that And that's always fun. There's something for everybody there. Donkeys, minis. Uh, gypsy vanners, saddle types, everything. So you're not going to want to miss that show. And if you're looking for an opportunity to go to this show, we're going to give you somebody to talk to. Somebody that Merle's worked with quite a bit. And Merle, this guy knows the show ring. Yes, he does. Our next guest needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway. <laughs> Justin's been at the Pinot World. In fact, the first time I've met Justin might have been at the Pinot World. And he's been a horse trainer for a long time. He's out of Burleson, Texas right now. Please welcome our next guest, Justin Brown, to the show. Justin, welcome to Better Horses. Yes, thank you all for having me on. Thanks, Justin. Can you tell us just a little bit about your history and, and tell us how you got started? You know, I've been uh, doing this for about 30 years professionally, and I grew up with my uh, parents being trainers, you know, locally and what have you, and uh and just grew up from there, uh, showing, you know, local 4-H to 
open shows, uh, eventually AQHA and then APHA and then you know, all the all the associations growing up and just kind of got the bug at an early age and went pro when I was 17 and, and really have not regretted it ever since. It's uh, been fun traveling to a lot of places, meeting lots of people in the industry and making lots of long-term connections through and through and, and uh, having fun along the way. Justin, for the guys that are out there, the horse owners that hasn't got into the show ring or hasn't gone to these shows, how can they get that bug that you have and how can they get to that first step to get to the show? How would you, how would you guide them? I would suggest that if they have an, an interest and in, say uh, in, in a particular discipline like a Western pleasure or trail or even, you know, you know, hunter hunter saddle events that the first thing they'd want to do is, is, uh, you know, find a local trainer in the area and take lessons first before you make a purchase on a horse. Cause it, it's a big investment, no matter which discipline or uh, which uh, avenue you want to go. And then, you know, take guidance from that person of, of getting maybe, maybe a local level horse and not spend a whole lot of money, you know, just to kind of see if they like it, see if the family is into it, the kids are into it, you know, to, before you in, go and invest in a, a lot of money on an upper level horse to show big, if, if uh, your interests aren't, aren't uh, going that direction. I always try to sit down and assess any new clients on what are your goals? What is, what is it that you want to do? So that I try to get them to the level or, or accomplish the direction they want to, want to go in. Because at the end of the day, if the clients aren't having fun or the, the people getting into this industry aren't, aren't having fun, they're getting discouraged or you take them to a, a level show that they're completely, you know, outclassed or knocked out of, they're not going to stay in it very long. And then the biggest thing we want to do is encourage people to keep this industry growing from all aspects and, and make it fun. You know, Justin, I think you, you bring an interesting perspective uh, because, and I don't know if all of our listeners know this, but you have been involved in a very serious horse accident. Can you tell us a little bit about that accident? But then more importantly to our listeners, can you tell them how, what you did to overcome? Was, was there any fear starting back up or how did you, how did you overcome those obstacles? Yes. I had a, 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 a three-year-old. This is about two years ago, uh, January 29th of 2022 that, uh, wasn't scared at all riding him. He had, I'd had a little over 30 days of, of a training on him and he decided to uh, throw a fit and proceeded to break into bucking with me. And, and granted my younger self, probably, probably my 25 year old version of myself probably could have hung on, but <laughs> I, but by the time he was, I was looking, by the time I knew that I couldn't ride the fourth to fifth jump, I was looking to the left because I know if I could swing off the left, I could hit the ground and pivot off my left foot and be fine. But when I was looking at that, he twists and arches back to the right. So I went off to the right and landed on my back and, and a compression fractured my L1, which I've always been able to hit the ground and just roll over and get up. Except the weirdest thing is I went to roll and my back was like pinned against the dirt. It wouldn't, it wouldn't move. Like there was no, there was no movement at all. And I was like, okay, I felt an internal pop and I can't roll over. This is not good. <laughs> so <clears throat> long story short, I had to be taken out by an ambulance, you know, and everything. And, and I was, laid up where I couldn't ride for about four, four months, which for me, I, I, and I found out that due to this big old round thing, you know, CT scan of your body and everything, they found where I had actually broke my back four other times that I was not aware of. Uh, that I probably did when I was 18, 20 years old, but those breaks in my back were up higher. So it didn't, you know, affect me walking yeah. or riding. You know, I just thought I was a little stiff those days, <laughs> you know, kept, kept rolling. <laughs> but, uh, Go, go, well, because my, my stepdad, he was an, an ex-professional bull rider and bareback rider. He had, he had worn like some big stuff back in the 40s and 50s. So he was kind of like, you know, you, you get up, boy, you get off that horse, you get off that horse, you get back on it, keep rolling. I was more scared of him than I was the horse I was trying to ride. <laughs> what did you do to overcome that? I did overcome, well, luckily I could, I could go out there and, and sit in a chair. And, and I had a, a lady that, that ironically, maybe, maybe this all works out. You know, hey, God works in mysterious ways that she wanted to learn more about how to be, become a more effective trainer and, and it, part of her education. So I was able to educate her on riding all my horses, which, uh, you know, allowed me to be able to keep my entire clientele, you know, nobody went anywhere, which was a blessing. And that, that helped me you know, overcome my business and keep it going. And then I was eventually, when I was eventually able to get into the saddle, I'd get on and start walking one around and I could feel the tension in my bag. I had a brace on everything and be okay. That's all I could do. Maybe five minutes of walking. 
And then uh, eventually it got to where I felt like I could jog one a little bit. And then granted, I'd get on with the really broke ones, you know, they weren't going to do anything because I couldn't take any, any jolts of any kind. And I felt like I'd jog a little bit. And then maybe I'd try to lope one off a stride and I'd be like, oh, 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 oh nope, nope, I can't do no more than that. <laughs> I feel the pain. But I, I, but I just had that determination that, you know, I'm just going to keep trying and trying. But, you know, doctors would say, you know, give an additional amount. I'm like, you don't understand. I got horses get ready for the world show. But, but uh, slowly, slowly, without, without causing any setbacks at all, it's just kind of like you know, I just kept testing the waters more and more, you know, after I got to the four month point to, to, uh, help me overcome the, the fear of, and, and basically, and I never had any fear of, you know, is, is, is am I going to have a mental repercussion if the next horse, gonna, if one horse starts that kind of funny, am I going to like break the saddle or, or something or have any, you know, you know, mental trauma from, from being bucked off hard. And, and for me, that was never the case. I've been bucked off plenty of times. My, my only, my only fear was, is it going to hurt if a horse, you, you know, jolts me or something or you know or bends me a certain way and and just one of those deals you just keep building little by little and and eventually i, I felt we're so, and, it was just, and it was just basically getting to know your body again getting to know what your body can take and what your body can't take you know bouncing back from that you know <laughs> we were talking about that yeah no, yeah yeah I'd, I'd say bounce from that but but one of those long gated bounces were <laughs> a lot of crawling involved but but uh definitely 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 don't bounce back up like i used to that's for sure you know, if you're just joining us, we're t- we're talking to Justin Brown from Justin Brown Show, uh, show Horses. Um, Justin, what about the PTSD that you have when you got back on? You talked about your PT that you had to go through physical therapy, but then you got on that horse the next time. How did you get through that mentally? Well, ironically, the horse that, that had bucked me off pretty hard, I didn't proceed to ride that anymore because a horse that will do that, that, that will get that rank, you just can't really trust. So I, so I told the owner to go another avenue and, 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 you know, and not that I didn't want anyone to have success on it, but it did make me feel a little better that they sent that horse to a Brazilian, a guy that does professional bareback horse, bareback riding horses. And that guy said that horse was tough. So, uh, you, you know, not, not that I want anyone not have any luck, but I mean, it sure would make me feel bad if someone said, oh man, I got on this horse and couldn't get him to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know what problem you had, <laughs> but but no, he, he he said that 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 horse was if you if you light off of him for a day or for a weekend, he, he would try to hurt you. Kind of one every once in a while you just run into one of those bad apples that are just kind of kind of that way, you know. No, we're glad you're you came out of that. Uh looking you went right back into the show ring. And going forward, when you're going to all these shows, because I know you're constantly on the road, how are you seeing the show circuit today? Are you seeing more youth coming on board, or do you see a lot of the the um, I call them the retirements out of their jobs and getting into the horse industry coming in. What's your thoughts? My thoughts are is is is, is no, I haven't seen a, a growth in the youth. I've only seen a decline in it, especially if you want to measure over the past decade. But what I have seen a huge increase in, and I don't, it doesn't matter if you go to quarter horse, plain horse, or palomino, is a huge increase in the amateur walk trot classes. Those have have really have really taken off. You know, even this. The, this past weekend, I was at a paint show in, in Waco, and I'm, and you you had no less than you know, fifteen horses in the amateur walk trot classes. Those are while, while you go to a regular amateur pleasure class, it might have seven, you know, or or, or these classes it might have you know, five. And it's it's that and the ranch classes. The ranch classes, you know, a lot of these show circuits now are setting like an entire day just for ranch just for the ranch classes because they literally take that long to get through them. So you bet. A, a growth in that. Yeah, a growth in that. So, so, so I can say, you know, maybe the, maybe the youth amateur in the open and as far as the ranch classes are, is what's really taken off hugely in, in all associations. But as far as the performance side of it, it's, it's definitely the, the, the amateur walk trot classes or, 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 like you said, people that have retired and, and, you know, can't afford to spend big money for a big horse, for a big time horse, but they can spend less money for, for a horse that can, that can jog like a 10 all day long. It just may not be the most talented loper. But you know what? That's not their goal. Is their envelope is just to have a really great, great jog and enjoy uh, showing those divisions. Sure, sure. And if you're just joining us, we have been talking to Justin Brown, a professional horse trainer from Burleson, Texas, and a good friend of ours. Justin, I know you're everywhere. You show a lot of different breeds. Can you tell uh, some of our listeners out there how would they best get a hold of if they want to talk to you and visit a little more about what you what you offer? Probably, probably the easiest way to look me up or something is, is I, I have a, a Facebook page, you know, and, you know, under under Justin Brown that they could could look up or Justin Brown Show Horses. 
or they can see shows and information and phone numbers and stuff or or, or what have sure. you. And as far as far as that that goes, just uh, I, I, a lot of people know me in a lot of areas. I've had a lot of people call me and say, "Hey, I asked so and so to get your number." And, you know, it's, sure. that's very good. Justin Brown at Justin Brown Shore Horses. You can check him out on Facebook page. Justin, we again appreciate you joining us here on Better Horses. Hope to have you come back. But right now, we got to take a break. Merle, I'm Ed Adams. And I'm Merle Arbo. And we'll be right back from a word from our sponsors. And we are back with more Better Horses. You know, Merle, this is a show that I promised everyone that we're going to go all over the country on. We've been to Mississippi. We've been to Texas. And now we get to go to California. And this segment is brought to you by our favorite team at the Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, they are doing a phenomenal job with their vet clinics. So if you ever want to see anything on their shows, check us out on betterhorses.com. We love to feature them and have all of their veterinarians give us great tips coming in with the horse industry. And as we promised, we're all over the country here. We're in Mississippi and we're in Texas, and now we're going to California I'm excited to bring one of the top female trainers of the quarter horse industry. She travels the world speaking at expos, equine affairs, and clinics. She's always on the road. Everybody, welcome to Better Horses. This is Dana Hokana. Dana, are you there? I'm here, and thank you so much for having me. You know, uh, I mentioned you traveling a lot. You're also heading over to Montana, and I'm assuming you're doing clinics at the Montana State University and also the 320 Ranch in Montana. And uh, you're doing private clinics and all over ranches and trainers around the country, are you not? I really am. And um, I'm just speaking at 320 Ranch, and we have a full group of people coming from the Dakotas, from from all over Montana, bringing horses and really a good group of hungry, eager people. And um, that's what I love to do is to help people and help horses. I feel like I'm a voice for the horse and the horseman. And I think that people, you know, really need to understand that knowledge truly is power. And the more knowledge that you acquire, the more power you have. You know, we're getting a lot of new riders coming into this industry and you Grabbed on a topic that we liked, Merle and I were talking about it. Can you give us more insight about how you handle and how you coach that timid rider that needs to be more, less hesitant when it's going into a, when it's afraid of a horse? And um, that is a topic dear to my heart because so many people in our industry, number one, get a horse maybe they can't handle or they have a that they don't understand, right? And that's where that learning and knowledge and seeking information and help comes in. But then they don't understand that they are a working, movable body part of many and tendons, ligaments, and functions, and so is their horse, right? So they have to, we have to somehow, as leaders and teachers, unite our rider with our big, powerful horse. How is that done? You know, and it's done with control um, and humane control of the horse, but the rider also understanding their part and how to play their part. And I think that it's fun to see riders who don't know a lot, don't understand how, how much their signals really matter to the horse and to teach them how to gain that confidence and that power with their horse. And that, that builds confidence. And so I, it's, that's really dear to my heart, this subject. And that's why I've done videos. I have a video club. I mean, I have videos just on steps to, to a more responsive horse, making sure their energy is, is in the right place for you to get on, for them to even be able to hear your signals, you know? So many timid riders try to ride a horse that's maybe not ready to process what they're teaching them. And then they get in trouble, you know? And, and they don't understand. It's not that you couldn't ride. It's not that it was a horse. But maybe it's just that that horse needed time to, you know, get rid of that excess energy. So there's just so much we can do to help timid riders. Everything from understanding how the horse works to understanding how your body works, bits and bridles, your hands, your direction of pull, your body, your seat, uh, controlling their energy levels and helping them be ready to ride. It's just a really big, vast area that we can help people become confident. And it's so joyful to see people become that confident rider. 
And you bring up a really good point. Uh, you know, timid riders, I think a lot of times they're worried about hurting their horses, you know, like not wanting to reprimand them too severely. How do you address that with the timid rider to explain to them that, hey, this is really not hurting, it's correcting their behavior? Yeah, and that that's a super good point, Ed, because so many timid riders always feel like it's their fault. I, and I had a, a girl that has a horse in training with me who lives up in Montana that was down for the last week. And she left a, a couple of days ago and she had been with the trainer. And this is, this is a, I guess, but it's a common thing. The trainer continually told her everything that her old horse was doing was her fault. And it wasn't always her fault. Sometimes it was the horse's fault. And sometimes timid riders immediately think it's my fault or I'm messing up the horse. Or like you just said, I may hurt the horse. And that's where I go back to what I said, knowledge is power. And understanding how bits and bridles work gives you the confidence to say, this is a, this is a normal bit. This is a good bit. I'm not hurting this horse. And understanding their own leg cues and realizing that this is a thousand pound animal, right? Or 800, 1200 pounds, whatever, whatever your horse is. And you weigh in the hundreds low. 100 200 pounds and you've got to somehow be able to conquer and have that horse respond to you now horses don't feel things the same way people do and that's another important thing i teach timid riders sometimes us humans and me included try to project how we feel about how something feels to us like our horse feels that way. But horses are a totally different system and being. They are a flight or fight animal. They don't process things like we do. They don't feel things like we do. They don't even think like we do, right? So we can't assume that we're hurting their feelings or we're doing this or that, just like it might us. And, and there, again, I say, you know, instruction and help and seeking knowledge can really help a timid rider. But the most important tips that I give a timid rider. And Ed, I hope this is okay. Once you get me talking, you know, I, I love to teach. <laughs> this but... is perfect. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. One of the most important tips I teach a timid rider is to control their own breathing. Because when you breathe and take full deep breaths through your diaphragm, you actually are feeling or, or um, you're actually stimulating the vagal or vagus nerve in your body, right? That nerve, when it's stimulated, releases endorphins, it releases hormones that help you relax. You know, your foot is enormously in tune to your breathing on their back and even on the ground. And when you take short, shallow breaths and you, you know, partially hyperventilate or you take short, shallow breaths, another thing that happens is you arch your back and lean forward and you don't take full deep breaths. So if you're on their back, your sacrum or tailbone or bottom end comes up off their back lightly and you lean forward. You're sending a signal to that horse that something's wrong. And maybe nothing's wrong, but maybe you're scaring the horse nothing more than by changing your breathing, your seat, your rhythm. When you put your hand over your belt buckle or over your belly and you take a deep breath and you can know you're breathing correctly by if you push out your hand and you take a deep, full breath, your sacrum and your seat actually comes down on the horse. Your own sensory perception increases to where you feel their rhythm, you feel their next move so much faster and so much better. And you relax the horse because the horse also has a lot of hormones and endorphins and relaxing chemicals that they release when you are doing things correctly. So that's a magic tip and there's many other. Well, you're right. You bring up a good point. Fear and you freeze, you bring up the wrong signals. You're a mess, whether you're just riding or you're in the show ring. I think as trainers, at what point do we tell these riders you need to reduce your horse or get another horse? And I think that's the trick. What do you find? How do you, how do you address that with a rider? First of all, I try to make the rider know it's not, it's not like wrong. It's not like you failed. It's not that you're not good enough not like even your horse necessarily failed. It might be that you and your horse aren't that match, right? And that it's a positive thing, not a fit. And when I've had riders that feel responsible for the rest of that horse's life, like, well, where will I sell it or what will I do? 
And I, and I try to say again, you know, I, as a breeder, raise colts that I try so hard to control their future. And you can't always do that. You, know, you can do your due diligence to sell that horse to a good, good match or a good fit. But ultimately, this is your life that you're on this earth to live. And you need to protect yourself and also protect your, your joy because horses are supposed to be a joy to us. So I start out by making sure they know it's not their fault. They didn't fail. And sometimes horses, people can have old issues, post-traumatic stress disorder, problems due to how they were treated in the past. So can horses. And I have more horses that I'm undoing behavior patterns that have started. Like, for example, you know, a horse, a horse is stimulated to be afraid when they react a certain way. So they almost go to that and react naughty because they're so afraid of the punishment, right? And so I have to redo that behavior pattern that is ingrained into that horse and people also. So I start with timid people, you know, trying to push a horse and I try to help them have a good match. Then I teach them about breathing. I teach them to count the rhythm with the horse. So that helps them hook up, hook up or unite with that horse, you know, the trot is to beat gate. Let's just find the rhythm. Let's just find and connect you to. And let's breathe. Let's relax. Let's un- understand to unlock our pelvis rather than using our upper body to pump or ride. Let's unlock the pelvis. You know, I teach people where to sit on their horse. And I teach them that there to be, it's, it's hard when you're emotionally involved and you love an animal. But it's really important to love that animal but stay objective. And also take care of yourself and your own future too. And that's, that's how I handle that. I love it when you go into the mechanics of riding and how important they are. And yes, all the horses have different personalities. And we're talking to Dana Hokana Quarter Horses. And Dana, if people wanted to get to know more about you or talk about your training videos, what's the best website to go to? My website is www.hokana.com. And also teamhokana.com, www.teamhokana.com. I've got a phenomenal videos, tapes. I have a YouTube channel. My Facebook is Dana Hokana Performance Horses and Instagram. I have a lot of videos on YouTube that are, you know, tons of free help for people. Lots and lots of help, training videos, teaching videos. I have a lot on my Facebook also. On my website, we have, I have video DVD topics available in DVD form or streaming form. And then the other really neat help I have for people is Team Hokana Video Club. There's over 230 videos and they, they were just done live lessons in the arena, me working a horse, maybe me at a show helping someone get ready. You know, how I teach people to use your hands, breathing, confidence, uh, groundwork, uh, colt breaking. This video club is available anywhere, anytime, you know, that you have internet and it's $19.95 a month and you have unlimited access to all of these videos. But I really want to help horses and riders. They can email us. They can contact us. You know, we, I give clinics all over and speak at different expos, but there's a lot of resources. And, and again, I go back to that, you know, gaining knowledge gives you more confidence and power with your horse. You know, a lot of people get a horse and think, well, I had a horse as a kid. I'm okay. But, you know, you wouldn't get a new car with all kinds of new systems and not study and learn about it. And, you know, horses deserve that too. We deserve that with our horses. So I think that increasing your knowledge is is the number one thing to do if you're a new rider or a timid rider. Could not agree with you more. I want to thank you for joining our show as always. We never have enough time. So for everybody out there, you check out the website, Okana.com or TeamOkana.com. You know, Merle Dana writes for training articles of one of the largest publications in the United States. And I told her if this really interview goes well, she's going to give us an article for our Better Horses newspaper. So I think we may have accomplished that. So Dana, thank you again for joining Better Horses. All right. I'm so honored and thank you and good to meet everybody. Okay. But right now we got to take a break. Merle, I'm Ed Adams. And I'm Merle Arbo. And we'll be right back from a word from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Dr. Dylan Luter, a specialist in equine performance medicine at the Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center. 
Our new service focuses on lameness diagnosis, advanced imaging, physical therapy, and regenerative medicine for horses with injuries preventing them from performing at their best. We can treat a variety of conditions and design a customized rehabilitation plan to meet the needs of each client and their horse. Visit us at ksvhc.org, the Veterinary Health Center, to discover, to teach, to heal. Hi, I'm Tommy with Heritage Tractor. Whether you're looking to maintain your yard or your whole ranching operation, Heritage Tractor has John Deere mower and tractor packages that make work fly by. With a variety of horsepower and attachment configurations, we have a package to best fit your needs and budget. To learn more about these exclusive packages, visit us in store or online at HeritageTractor.com. Legendary products, extraordinary service, that's our heritage. Established in 1956, the Pinto Horse Association of America was formed to welcome all types of equines and maintain their show records and pedigrees. PTHA currently has over 88,000 members with 157,000 registered Pintos. There are currently three separate registries, the Color Registry, the Solid Registry, and the Long Ear Registry. We welcome all levels of competition within a family-friendly environment. Become a member, register, and add value to your horse. For more information, check out the website Pinto World. World.com. Runny nose, cough, fever. It's flu season for humans and horses. Like human flu vaccines, equine flu vaccines must be updated to protect against the flu strains circulating now. Merck Animal Health's flu-containing vaccines include the most current flu strains, protecting your horse from illness and time mistraining because of it. Talk with your veterinarian about prestige flu vaccines. And learn more about the science of advanced protection at PrestigeVaccines.com. We're here for the hardworking, the resilient. We're for the people who measure their days by what needs to get done, not by hours. Where kids learn responsibility at a young age and generations work side by side. Where work doesn't pause for holidays or bad weather. It just gets harder. Where value and hard work means more than the clothes you wear. We're Kleinschmidt's Western Store, Higginsville, Missouri. It's time to go with United Mosquito and Fly Control's premier fly system for fly control in your barn. Providing relief for horses from the stress of fighting flies. And also makes a barn more pleasant for everyone in the barn. Easy, effective, and safe. With United Mosquito and Fly Control, we provide a full service. You as the barn owner don't have to do anything. We go everywhere and take care of everything with our friendly, fast service. Call today at 913-558-3814 or email paul at unitedmosquito.com. 2024 is the year to compete in the world's largest horse show, the Pinto World Championship. This 13-day event begins June 8th, starting with our youth weekend through June 22nd, and caters to all riding levels and ages. With over $1 million in cash and prizes, there are no qualifications required to enter. Held in Tulsa, Oklahoma, located at the Ford Complex, the Pinto World Championship caters to all types of equines. With over 700 classes, the Pinto Show welcomes a variety of breeds to compete. It's a family environment with healthy competition. For more information, check out the website PintoWorld.com. You know, Merle, Dana brings up so much good information about the timid rider. And I think it's very, very important that we continue to learn and continue to train, get out there, go to the shows, and just to Dana's point, have fun with these horses. Sure. I think the hardest part for uh, a timid rider to understand is it's not an automobile. You know, as you get more comfortable with your automobile, it's easier to drive. But the car is not learning from your mistakes. And that horse is. And I I think a lot of people, once they start realizing that, that horse is learning from, not necessarily learning good things, (laughs) but learning from me. And I'm training it, whether it's something good or something bad. Yeah, it's a very good point. So if you haven't checked us out, uh, betterhorses.com commits to its mission statement of just learning about training horses. And we're coming out with our spring edition, and that's coming out in the next week or so. So check us out at betterhorses.com. We have a newspaper and a TV show and on RFD and the Cowboy Channel. And as always, our radio show and our podcast. And don't forget, you might have seen me on Equus TV with Justin Brown. 
and you did a rather good job. That's Equus <laughs> TV streaming streaming network. They are, we really appreciate them picking us up. So as always, we're going to, we want to give special thanks to our team behind the scenes, radio producer, Brianna Johnson and our TV producer, Kelly Creech and all of our sponsors that we have backing sure. us up. But as always, we want you to be all good buckaroos and buckarets. Mind your mom and dads. Be brave, but don't take any chances out there. And until next time, I'm Ed Adams. And I'm Merle Arbo. Happy trails and always ride for the brand.